To continue the video on gamble cards and failed mechanics, we're actually going to be going over a lot of successful gamble cards over the game's history, starting off with some of the gamble staples. With these, we have number 85 Crazy Box, Fairy Box, Blowback Dragon, number 7 Lucky Straight, Snipe Hunter, and of course, Six Cents. All of these gamble cards were played as staple cards that happened to fit in with the theme of a particular deck. Let's start with number 85 Crazy Box. This is a generic rank 4 monster with 3000 attack and has the effect where it cannot attack. But it has an effect to detach one of its materials in order to roll a 6 sided die, where you can gain one of 6 effects. The reason Crazy Box saw play was because it was a 3000 attack beat stick, which you could just have its effect negated with something like Skill Drain in order to have easy access to a beat stick sometimes, or just a high attack monster on the field for other kinds of effects. It wasn't really played because of its gamble effect at all. Fairy Box is a continuous trap card where each time your opponent declares an attack, you're able to toss a coin and call heads or tails. And if you call it correctly, you get to reduce that monster's attack to zero, which could result in it getting destroyed if it was attacking into one of your monsters. And on a negative result, simply nothing happens. So it was kind of the case of, you constantly got to try for a very positive effect, and didn't really get anything bad if it happened to fail that result. Other than maybe your opponent attacking you directly when you really needed to reduce their attack to zero. And Dark Sanctuary has a similar effect, but without a maintenance cost every day. Blowback Dragon is a level 6 monster with 2300 attack that has the effect where once per turn you can target any card your opponent controls and then toss a coin three times. And if at least two of the results are heads, you get to destroy that card. So Blowback Dragon was played a lot in early Chaos decks, or just decks that could facilitate a Tribute Summon, because Blowback Dragon had decent stats for a level 6 monster at 2300 and had a chance to destroy back row in addition to monsters, even if it wasn't guaranteed. Plus it was dark attributes, so it could be useful in the graveyard later, while also having all the other benefits described. Number 7 Lucky Straight is a rank 7 Xyz monster which requires 3 level 7 monsters as materials, which means it's actually kind of hard to bring out. And it has the effect where it can detach one of its materials in order to roll a 6 sided die twice, where its attack becomes the larger of the two rolls times 700 until the end of your opponent's next turn, where you then gain an additional effect if both of the dice results happen to add up to exactly 7. So if you rolled a 5 and a 2, a 3 and a 4 for example, etc etc. You then got to choose one of three special effects, where you can either send all other cards in the field to the graveyard, special summon one monster from your hand or either player's graveyards, or draw three cards and discard two. All three of these effects were really good, much better than the effects of Gambler of Legend even, and that's supposed to be a pure gambling card. And it's easier to get a sum of seven when rolling two dice than it is to get three heads. The chance of getting three coin tosses on heads in a row is one in eight, or 12.5%. The chance of getting a sum of 7 on 2 dice rolls is 1 in 6, or 16.67%. So, if it's only slightly higher, why did a super gamble-focused card like Lucky Straight see competitive play, and even a ton of competitive play at that? Well, its effect is not once per turn, and it has 3 materials, which means when brought out, you could immediately try 3 times for an exact 7 dice result. And also, because it's an extra deck monster that can be special summoned, you don't have to waste up your normal summon to bring it out or any main deck space. And it's perfect for the type of thing that gamble cards are trying to go for, of just maybe having a really good effect if you're lucky, and it just being an option that you can summon. But its materials were really hard to work with, except for the fact that Dragon Rulers were able to spam out level 7 monsters like no other archetype has been able to do since. Dragon Rulers were kind of the king of having too many level 7 monsters in the field that they didn't know what to do with. So a lot of the times, Dragon Rulers would play Lucky Straight as just an option for mirror matches, where there were a lot of board states that Dragon Rulers just couldn't deal with, so a way of trying to deal with them was by using Lucky Straight and getting the ability to send all cards in the field to the graveyard. It was basically played because they didn't really have any other options that didn't target, and they could go into it very easily, and at the very least, they could try for a high beat stick, because if they rolled a 6 on one of their results, it would have 4900 attack. So it still wasn't a super successful gamble card, but it came very close. Then we have Snipe Hunter, which absolutely was a successful gamble card. Probably the most successful gamble card outside of Sixth Sense. Snipe Hunter is a level 4 monster with 1500 attack, which has the effect where you can discard one card, then target one card in the field and roll a 6 sided die. Where the result of the dice roll is anything but 1 or 6, you're able to destroy that card. Which means you have a 2 thirds chance of getting a positive result or a 1 in 3 chance of losing a discard from your hand with no positive result. And what made Snipe Hunter an absolute unit of a gamble card, that saw more competitive success than any other gamble card in the game's history, 
was the fact that its effect was not once perturbed and had a higher than a 50% chance to succeed, as a two-thirds chance comes out to around 66.7%. So, you have a higher chance of resolving Snipe Hunter's positive effect than you do of calling a coin toss correctly. And it was this tiny little boost in probability that allowed it to actually be very successful, especially since your opponent didn't actually know the result of the dice roll until the effect resolved. So, if you targeted one of your opponent's back row cards with Snipe Hunter's effect, they would have to choose to activate the effect immediately or risk the effect landing a positive result and getting the card destroyed before they got a chance to chain it. And since Snipe Hunter allowed you to basically use your entire hand to try to destroy your opponent's field, it was great for decks that love to ditch their cards from their hand to the graveyard in targeted amounts. So Snipe Hunter saw a ton of play in 2007 shortly after it came out, as an unlimited amount of targeted destruction was just unheard of at the time. And it was mostly played in decks that wanted cards in the graveyard, and was played alongside the Card Trooper, Machine Duplication, Dark Magician to Chaos, into a Metamorphosis, Cyber Twin Dragon, O2K with limited removal combo. Then in 2008 and 2009, it saw a ton of play in Dark Arm Dragon decks, before then seeing another resurgence in 2013 with Dragon Rulers, as a way to ditch all of them into the graveyard while destroying your opponent's cards in the field. So Snipe Hunter saw immediate impact when it first came out in all kinds of decks, then was used as a semi-staple in one of the few Tier 0 decks in the game's history, and then used again in another pseudo-Tier 0 deck with Dragon Rulers. You can't really have a more impressive record than Snipe Hunter, where the only card that could possibly beat it out in terms of playability, and also being a pure gamble card, would definitely have to be six cents, if it wasn't banned almost immediately after its introduction. So, those are the gamble cards which happen to fit into other decks as staples, we also have gamble cards, which were used because they don't care if their negative effect happens or not. Although that category is incredibly small, to the point where I can only really think of three of them, that being Cup of Ace, Fiend Comedian, and Paths of Destiny. The Paths of Destiny has the effect where both players toss a coin, and if the result is heads, you gain 2,000 life points, but if the result is tails, you take 2,000 points of damage. This card was played with bad reaction to Samochi decks, where no matter the result of your opponent's coin toss, they would take 2,000 points of damage which is a ton of damage to take from one card. And with Cup of Ace, it simply has the effect where you toss a coin and heads, you draw two cards, tails, your opponent draws two cards. It was occasionally played in OTK slash FDK decks that were trying to just draw a whole bunch of cards in one turn, because a lot of those decks would try to use cards like Hand Destruction in order to cycle through their deck faster. But Hand Destruction requires your opponent to have two cards in their hand in order to use and resolve the effect. So a lot of players were able to counter these FDK deck strategies by just setting everything in their hand during their turn. So Cup of Ace allowed you to actually give your opponent two cards so that you can continue all of your plays like normal, or if you got a heads, you just draw two cards, which was good as well. And Fiend Comedian has the effect where if you toss a coin and call it and you get a correct result, you get to banish all cards in your opponent's graveyard. But if you call it wrong, you send a number of cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard, equal to the number of cards in your opponent's graveyard. So on a positive result, you banish all the cards in your opponent's graveyard, which is good. And a negative result, you get to mill a whole bunch of cards, which is also good. So Fiend Comedian actually saw a lot of play in Lightsworn and Infernoid decks that love to mill cards. And outside of the examples I listed in these two past sections, that's pretty much it when it comes to cards that saw widespread competitive play while also being a gamble card. Now let's go over a different category of gamble cards, random gamble cards that are part of archetypes that are normally not about gambling. This category is incredibly small and I can only really think of two examples. First are Morphtronics. They have two level one monsters that have effects that are correlated to rolling dice. Morphtronics Smart Fawn has the effect that while it's an attack position, once per turn you can roll a six sided die. Look at that many cards at the top of your deck, then add one Morphtronic card from your deck to your hand amongst the ones you looked at. And then it has a defense position effect, where you can just look and rearrange the top cards of your deck equal to a dice roll. The other level 1 Morphtronic is Morphtronic Cellphon, which is a little bit better, as its effect is to roll a six-sided die to look at the top cards of your deck equal to the dice result. However, you then get to special summon a level 4 Allure Morphtronic monster amongst them, ignoring its summoning conditions. And its defense effect is to simply look at the top cards of your deck equal to a dice result, but then just return them to the deck in the same order. So Morphtronic Cellphon's attack position effect is the better of the two, because it potentially allows you to special summon a monster from your deck without a cost. So if you get Morphtronic Cellphon on the field, successfully resolve its effect by special summoning a single monster, then you just went plus one in card advantage from your deck, which is actually really good. Especially since it can special summon other copies of itself to try the effect again. The gamble nature of its effect is simply to rein in how good that effect actually is by not allowing you to just pick any target from your deck. 
Although, there is a chance you can roll a 1 and then the top card of your deck is not a Mortronic monster at all, and you don't get to special summon any monsters. Mortronic Selfon does see play Mortronic decks as kind of a staple card to get their plays going, but Morphtronics are not a competitive deck, probably because one of their best cards has a gamble effect tied to its good effect. Then if you look at the Speedroid archetype, they also randomly have a good card with a gamble effect called Speedroid Wheel. This is a quick play spell card which requires you to discard one card to activate it, then you get to roll a six-sided die. Based on the result of that dice roll, you then get to special summon one or two monsters from your hand or deck, just as long as the levels of those monsters is equal to the result of your dice roll, but their effects are negated. However, if you're not able to summon a monster, you lose life points equal to the result of the roll times 500. So if you roll a 6, for example, you can special summon two level 3 monsters from your deck. And with the discard cost, this is card neutral and card advantage, but being able to discard in order to special summon two monsters from your deck is incredibly good. So the random nature of the dice roll is there in order to rein in that really good effect, just like Morphtronic Selfon. And because of the random nature of the card, it's not super reliable to actually use. And there is the possibility that you'll only be able to summon one monster, or not that at all, if you just happen to roll a result where you don't have cards to special summon. Although with a possible upside to its effect, and with how most of the Speedroid monsters are low level anyway, I'm curious to see if Speedroid Wheel will actually be a staple part of the Speedroid archetype or not, because it is a rather new card that was released in 2021. Konami does still release new gamble-like effects randomly. The fact that Speedroid's got a random dice roll related card is probably because some of their cards have dice in their artwork. But they also just randomly release new gamble-like cards all the time anyway. Some of the more recent examples of modern gamble cards they've released randomly are Head Judging and Diced Dice. Diced Dice was released at the end of 2020 and is a quick play spell card, which has the effect to roll a six-sided die. And if you roll a one or six, you get to search any card from your deck that requires a die roll. However, if you fail, which is more than likely since you only have a 1 in 3rd chance of succeeding, then you get to roll another 6-sided die to determine what happens next. Where if you happen to roll a 1 or 6, you get to return this card to your hand. But since the card itself has a hard once per turn, you won't be able to try for its effect again until your next turn. But if you roll a 2 to 5, you place the card on top of your deck instead. Which means you'll probably get to try again on your next turn, but it's taking up your normal draw, which is pretty bad. This card was most likely created in order to interact with that 6, to always force a result of 1 or 6 on a die roll. Head Judging was released in 2020 and is a continuous trap card which has the effect where if a monster activates its effect on the field, you can choose to make the activating player toss a coin and call it. If they call it correctly, then Head Judging destroys itself. If they call it incorrectly, however, then the activation of the effect is negated and you get to change control of that monster to your opponent. So Head Judging has the potential to both negate the effect of one of your opponent's monsters, and then take control of it, and it forces the coin toss on your opponent. However, if they simply call it correctly, then the card immediately goes to the graveyard and you go minus one in card advantage. But if you're successful, you go plus two in card advantage with that steal. And then you'll get to use it again on your next turn since it's a continuous trap card with only a hard once per turn limitation on its effect. Head judging saw all of no play in the regular TCG, but it is currently semi-limited in dual links. In Duel Links, Gamble decks have been a lot more successful because they have skills in the game which allow you to force positive results, like one of the most famous ones, Master of Destiny, for example, which allows the first three coin tosses you make in a duel to always land on heads. So, this skill turns Cup of Ace into a pure pot of greed, without any chance of getting the negative effect. And that skill was very good and kind of overpowered, Especially since they also released Desperado Barrel Dragon in the game at around the same time the skill was added, which actually gave Gamble decks a decent boss monster to rally behind. Desperado Barrel Dragon can special summon itself from your hand if a Dark Machine type monster you control is destroyed by battle or card effect. During the battle phase, you can forego its attack in order to toss a coin three times, where you can then destroy a number of face up monsters in the field up to the number of heads. And you gain an extra effect where if you get three heads, you also get to draw one card. Then, if this card is sent to the graveyard in any way, you get to add a level 7 or lower monster from your deck to your hand that has a coin toss in effect. So, Desperado could bring itself out from your hand with BM4 Blast Spider destroying one of your opponent's cards, it could then destroy all of your opponent's cards during the battle phase, and it could search out another coin toss card from your deck if it was sent to the graveyard from the field or hand, as you could use it as a full cost for something like Machina Fortress in order to bring itself out. And then, search out one of your coin toss effects. And not only was this gamble deck good in Duel Links, it was kind of oppressive. To the point where they had to nerf a lot of the cards involved. So there's a couple of gamble cards that are on their ban list purely to reduce the power level of Master of Destiny decks. And this was after they nerfed the skill itself multiple times. 
having guaranteed head results is just that powerful, especially in a low power level version of the game like Duel Links. Which kind of leads into the last point of the video. What could they do if they wanted gamble effects to be more competitive? Duel Links already kind of solved that problem by just allowing you to guarantee the positive result of those gamble effects. In order to play Master Destiny, your deck needs to have seven or more cards with different names that require a coin toss. And it even skips your first draw phase during the duel, so you start off with a minus one in card advantage. And even with all of those restrictions on the deck building and the direct negative to your card advantage, they still had to limit a whole bunch of the cards to reign in that deck's power level. So, if in the TCG, they created an archetype all about allowing you to force positive results on gamble effects, that would probably elevate them to competitive status. Although, the way they could do that without any skills in the normal game is kind of difficult to think about, because it would require them to pretty much create an entire archetype around this concept, where they wouldn't really need to use the old gamble cards anyway. So outside of creating a whole new archetype that's kind of like the Master of Destiny skill from Duel Links, what they could do is create gamble cards that have effects more similar to Sixth Sense or Graceful Dice, where you just have varying levels of positive successes, and you don't actually get a negative effect at all for using the card. If we were to take a look at something like Dice Foon as an example of something to fix, Dice Foon has the effect on a quick play spell card that has a chance to destroy spell trap cards on the field. Since it's a quick play spell card, it has all of the benefits of MST, but it has the terrible downside where, if you roll a 1 or 6, not only does it not destroy a card, but you take 1,000 points of damage. So because the card has a 1 in 3rd chance of being purely detrimental, it doesn't really see competitive play in the TCG. If we were to fix this card in order to make it more playable, what you could do is change that 1 in 6 effect, where instead of having the card having a purely detrimental effect to you, it could have a lesser positive effect instead, of maybe only destroying a face down spell or trap card. That way, all possible effects on its dice roll would have a positive effect, and that would probably make the card actually see play and not really be overpowered in any way. And in fact, Konami kind of did this when they created the new fusion card for Time Wizard, where its effect is to destroy all monsters in the field, and the coin toss simply determines if you or your opponent takes life point damage equal to half the original attack of the destroyed monsters. And also, Desperado Barrow Dragon is a good example of a gamble card because its effect has such a small chance of having a negative effect, as during the battle phase it's able to toss a coin three times and destroy a number of face-up monsters equal to the result of heads. So, you have a 12.5% chance of getting three tails, which would result in no cards getting destroyed and only giving up your attack in order to activate that effect, which means nothing if you're using this effect during your opponent's battle phase. So, if they were to make a gamble card suck less, what they could do is just make the effect always do something positive and only have a better positive effect if it fully succeeds. Even Snipe Hunter would be improved if it actually did something useful on its 1 or 6 result, as the reason it stopped seeing play after Dragon Rulers was because the effect is just not good enough in the modern metagame for a main deck monster that requires your normal summon. Because even if the effect has a 100% chance to destroy a targeted card with its cost, it probably wouldn't be good enough to see play today. Just to give an example of how far the game has progressed since 2013, in fact, we can be pretty certain it wouldn't see any play, seeing as they unbanned Tribe Infecting Virus, which can discard one card to potentially destroy all of your opponent's monsters without a gamble, on a non-once-per-turn effect as well, and it doesn't see any competitive play at all. So, in conclusion, the reason gamble cards don't really work in Yu-Gi-Oh! is because a lot of them are bad, and the best gamble cards in the game are ones that were useful for things besides its gamble effect, had a higher than 50% chance to succeed, that gamble effect while also being useful for other things, or had a positive effect no matter the outcome of the gamble. And there were almost no exceptions to these rules. And there's a lot of other bad gamble cards I didn't even mention in the video, because I think I covered enough of them.